now we will start with the scientific part. It's really my pleasure to introduce Professor Richard Spritz from Denver. And Professor Spritz is a great scientist as a director of human medical genetics and genomics program at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. He's done great works regarding the genetics of vitiligo. He was capable to manage the international groups of the people involved in, this, uh, in these studies. He will give us the lecture about genetic and environmental correlates of vitiligo. Please, Professor Spritz. Good morning, good day, or good evening, wherever you may be. That you're listening to this recording indicates I'm not there with you, and for that I apologize. I'll be speaking today on the genetic and environmental correlates of vitiligo, where we've been, where we are, and where I think we're going. I'd like to dedicate my talk today to the memory of Ying Jin, MD, PhD, who unfortunately passed away about a year ago. For well over a decade, Ying was a prime mover in genetic studies of vitiligo in my laboratory, and she's sorely missed by her family, by myself, and by the research community. The development of vitiligo has two principal biological components, an innate genetic predisposition with which you're born and environmental triggers that one encounters over the course of one's life. Together, these ultimately result in loss of immune tolerance and development of disease, and then subsequently the disease has a natural history. The biology that underlies development of disease may or may not be the same as the biology that underlies disease progression and natural history. And that has important implications for potential treatments. I'll be talking in terms of what we call a multifactorial liability threshold model. And that's a fancy way of saying something really very simple, that there are two components of risk, genetic and environmental, that these more or less add up, and that total risk is distributed across the entire population, and that only those people whose total risk exceeds some ill-defined threshold actually develop disease. From the standpoint of the genetic component, I'll be think talking in terms of genetic architecture, the way the genes interact to cause risk. From the period about 1997 to 2020, I collaborated with Pam Fain and Stephanie Santorico to identify a large number of genetic risk genes, and similar studies went on in other labs around the world. Altogether, at this point, we know about 52 common vitiligo genetic risk loci, some in Europeans and some in Asians. Many of these loci, risk loci are shared across populations, some are not. Each contributes only a small fraction of total genetic risk. And many of the genes and the corresponding causal variants are now known. About three quarters of the variants are regulatory, and about one quarter are protein structural variants. These genes describe a corresponding protein network that represents a functional circuit of melanocyte immune tolerance, targeting, and cell killing. We can actually measure the fraction of total vitiligo liability that is genetic and environmental. And it turns out that the vitiligo genetic component, which we call heritability or H squared, is remarkably high. And it happens to be the same from both family studies and from GWAS, about 80%. There's no so-called missing heritability. We've actually accounted for pretty much all of the genetic component of vitiligo. Now, of the 80% of total risk that's genetic, about two-thirds come from common or GWAS variants, and about one-third from rare variants, most of which we haven't yet identified, but we can measure in total. Shown as a pie chart, then, about 20% of vitiligo risk is environmental, and then of the 80% that's genetic, Two-thirds is accounted for by common variants, one-third by rare variants. So the common variants account for over half of vitiligo risk overall. Vitiligo genetic risk, then, is clearly polygenic, with most risks coming from a multiplicity of common variants, and then about a third of total risk coming from various rare variants that individually have large effects but are quite rare. 
we can use this genetic knowledge to create a vitiligo polygenic risk score in which we simply combine the risk from each of the many different genes that are known and their effect sizes into a score that gives a single measure. And it, that measure distinguishes vitiligo cases from unaffected individuals quite well. It, vitiligo risk then is basically additive. Vitiligo is much less polygenic than other complex diseases. The odds ratios from GWAS loci is more than twice that of other complex diseases. And if we consider the top percentile of cases versus everybody else, the odds ratio is about 8.79. In other words, that these people have very high risk indeed. And the total risk score has a very good positive predictive value, about 0.71, almost good enough to use in a clinical context to predict who will get vitiligo versus who won't. One of the questions that interested us considerably was how does genetic risk differ in large families with multiple affected relatives versus singleton cases which account for about 92% of all vitiligo patients. When we studied the polygenic risk score in singleton cases versus these multiplex families, what we found is that the risk was consistently higher in the multiplex families and that this higher risk furthermore was over transmitted to the affected relatives in the multiplex family. So in both cases, singletons versus multiplex families, the risk is polygenic. As you might expect though, the larger the family, the greater the polygenic risk. So the more affected relatives, the greater the polygenic risk from the common vitiligo loci that affect even singleton cases. We also studied the largest vitiligo multiplex family that we've ever seen with 13 affected relatives that occurs in almost a dominant pattern. And in this family, all affected relatives carry a high penetrance mutation in the gene FOXD3. But in addition, all of the affected relatives also carry very high polygenic vitiligo risk. They're in the highest quintile for vitiligo cases. And that adds up to an odds ratio coming simply from the polygenic risk component over 3.2. So this family has both a high polygenic vitiligo risk and a rare high penetrance FOXD3 mutation. So in summary of vitiligo genetic architecture then, vitiligo risk is polygenic. Um, it's less polygenic than most complex diseases and we can use that to build a polygenic risk score showing that vitiligo polygenic risk from the common and rare variants is basically additive and that there's greater additive polygenic risk in multiplex families than in singleton cases. Now what do we know about vitiligo environmental triggers? Well in 1876 Heinrich Kebner showed that various types of skin diseases that involve an inflammatory component or an immune component can be triggered by skin damage, potentially accompanied by microinfection. And he first showed this for psoriasis, but later extended it to include vitiligo. Now we don't know any vitiligo environmental triggers for sure. Um, and so we've studied vitiligo age of onset as a surrogate for cumulative triggering. And a few years ago, we showed that vitiligo has two age of onset subgroups, about one third of cases involving early onset with a mean of about 10 years, and two thirds of cases having late onset with a mean of about 34 years. And we showed that the early onset subgroup is specifically associated with an ultra high risk MHC class two enhancer variant, an odds ratio over eight, and that drives increased expression of HLA-DQ. Um, one question that we really don't know the answer to, though, is whether vitiligo age of onset just reflects one's total liability, genetic plus environmental, and this specific enhancer uh, haplotype simply confers very high genetic liability because of that high odds ratio leading to, as a group, earlier onset. You may know that type 1 diabetes has increased in prevalence over time and it's been suggested that this may result from a changing milieu of environmental triggers. 
Um, we don't have longitudinal data for vitiligo prevalence, and so what we've studied as a surrogate is age of onset over time from the period 1951 to 2013. And what we showed is that whereas vitiligo age of onset was fairly flat from 1951 to 1970, and then again from 2004 on, that from the period about 1970 to 2004, Vitiligo, vitiligo age of onset became progressively later, and the p-value on this is 10 to the minus 48, um, with a delay of about 0.44 years per calendar year during this period. And so vitiligo effectively changed from being a pediatric disease with onset about 15 years to an adult onset disease with onset at age about 32 years during this period. This progressive delay in vitiligo age of onset has been the case both in North America and in Europe. And so whatever's going on, it transcends this continental boundary. And based on very limited data, it appears to have also been taking place in Asia at the same time, suggesting that this is a general change. Now, it isn't clear whether this is an overall delay of disease onset or whether there's actually an increase in prevalence of late onset cases, which would then tend to delay the apparent age of onset over time. But we can get some indication of what might be going on by studying these three periods, 1951 to 69, 1970 to 2004, and 2005 to 2013 separately. And what you can see is that across these three periods, the proportions of early onset cases versus late onset cases has flipped. We started out with mostly early onset cases, and now we have mostly late onset cases. There's actually been almost no change in the early onset group. The age of onset's the same. Don't worry about the height of the peaks. Um, but the late onset group has become pro proportionately larger and broader, suggesting that this delay in age of onset is being driven almost entirely by the late onset. So so is what's going on is reduced triggering due to an unknown environmental improvement. We've made things better and so that most cases are happening later. In that case, disease prevalence would be unchanged or reduced versus that there simply is an increased prevalence of later onset vitiligo, in which case overall vitiligo prevalence is increasing. And as I said, unfortunately, we have no longitudinal vitiligo prevalence data, which I think would be a great project for vitiligo patient organizations to take on worldwide. So to summarize what we now know about vitiligo genes and the environment, we know that vitiligo risk is polygenic and accounts for about 80% of total vitiligo risk. Nevertheless, vitiligo is less polygenic than most complex diseases, and about two-thirds of genetic risk comes from common variants and about one-third from rare variants, and that this risk is basically additive. There's greater additive polygenic risk in multiplex families that have multiple affected relatives than in singleton cases. In terms of genes, early vitiligo onsets associated with carrying a rare, ultra-high risk MHC class II haplotype. In terms of environment, though, vitiligo onset became much later over the period 1970 to 2003, and this is being driven by later onset cases. There's not been any change in the genetics that underlies early onset. There's been a change in the environmental risk that may be leading to an increased number of vitiligo cases overall. So in light of what we know, what are some remaining questions for the future? Is all polygenic vitiligo just one basic biological process, or are there multiple endotypes that are defined by different genes and different pathways? That has implications for treatment. Is vitiligo genetic architecture and pathobiology similar across different world populations? Likewise, that has implications for treatment. Do vitiligo disease risk loci also play roles in disease natural history and clinical course? I submit that it's the latter, the genes that are involved in vitiligo natural history, that define biology most relevant to treatment. 
What are vitiligo environmental triggers? And are those environmental triggers increasing or decreasing in our environment? And likewise, is vitiligo prevalence increasing in the population? All of these things we need to know to better understand how to treat vitiligo. I finally like to stop and thank my many collaborators over the years, both in my lab and around the world, um, without whom none of the work that I presented today would be possible. And thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Professor Spritz, for this very outstanding lecture, very clear, and you know you have concluded with a lot of questions still open about the situation of vitiligo. That is great, certainly we have uh, no, a lot of things to be done, but you know it, it's stimulating that to have rise of this question of for all the community, the people working on vitiligo. Uh, so there are some some questions. One question is related to have you examined the genetic background of patients experience checkpoint blockade related to vitiligo? I'm not sure I understand the question. Thus uh, far, none of the genes that we have found would relate to would obviously relate to something like checkpoint blockade. Okay. And another question. Uh, was that, do you think uh, that there is any treatment implication for early onset and late onset? This is a quite interesting situation, no? That the appearance of this late onset appearance of vitiligo. What, so, do you think that there is some uh, treatment implication about this, find, this finding that you have reported? So, I don't know. Um, I would, uh, in general, I tend to think that the genes that we found which are all found by comparing one way or the other, the genomes of people who do have vitiligo versus don't have vitiligo. I think that those genes mostly or completely have to do with triggering. That, though, that what happens after you get the disease may involve completely different biological pathways and of course underlying genes. And so therefore the the genes that are involved with triggering, unless we can discover a way to reverse triggering and go backwards, may not be the right pathways and genes to study for treatment. Yeah. So, whether it's early onset or late onset. Uh, this is really very fascinating question on the role of the triggering factors, because we know that a lot of ladies uh, uh, with vitiligo, they they frequently are aware about to have some some children to have just uh, you know some pregnancy would risk to transmit the disease to the children, of course. So the relevance role that the triggering factor, uh, as you have demonstrated, had could suggest that probably even if you can transmit some predisposition to develop the disease, you can try to modify the course of the appearance of the disease. Probably if we were capable to identify some. Uh, of the way how the triggering factors are working on vitiligo. What do you think? That we can suggest some preventive procedure that could be done for children becoming from family with vitiligo? I, I don't know the answer to the really interesting yeah, question no, what, that you raised. What, what's your hypothesis? Probably you can say to, 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 to a young lady with vitiligo, so probably you can do something to avoid the risk that uh, the vitiligo would appear to your a child? Should yeah, I think, that's, I think yeah. that's where we have to go. So I, I'm I think we have a clue from the fact that later on, my guess is that later onset vitiligo is increasing in frequency, that yeah. early onset vitiligo has not changed in frequency because that's more driven by genetics. Later onset vitiligo is maybe more driven by the environment. And the, the data that I showed on the overall impact of early onset versus, I'm sorry, the heritability of vitiligo overall reflects the total group. I suspect if you studied only the early onset versus only the late onset, the heritability, the genetic impact would be higher in the early onset and less in the late onset. I think that's good news because your question is if we were able to know what the environmental factors were that were driving an increased prevalence of late onset, we might be able to avoid them and we might be able to reverse them too. 
So I'm hopeful for that. Of course, we don't know. Maybe have a couple of, of questions to, from the audience. Yeah. Maybe I will have one question to this because I think one of the most interesting papers that you have uh, written, despite all, all, all the big things that you did, is the paper in the GID on the shift in the age of onset, which is for me something really uh, very interesting, not only for vitiligo, but probably for most autoimmune diseases. And the important thing is to uh, identify trigger. And the only way to identify triggers is probably to have cohorts of general population and to be able to look exactly at the exposition. And we are for the moment, we are having a big study in France called Constance, which is following more than 200,000 people. We have identified in this cohort all those having vitiligo with the age of onset of their vitiligo. And we are for the moment doing a kind of capture of all the exposure that they had during all their life because we know where they work it and the exposition they get from more, the exposition they get from the environmental pollution. And I have a PhD for the moment working on this and what our hope is that almost everyone knows that maybe hair dyes can be a trigger, but I think hair dyes is not really the only trigger that we have. It's the only one that is easily identifiable. And what we are trying to do is to see using a, a very complex uh, statistic model, how to build a kind of clustering uh, of uh, the risk, uh, the triggering risk of vitiligo. And uh, we are now finalizing to reconstitute the uh, work map of all the individuals in this cohort and probably all the exposures. And I think in the next five years, we should be able to come with a specific uh, trigger uh, for vitiligo. Okay. We have another couple of questions from the audience, that probably will be more relevant to, to read to Richard. Uh, there are the one question is how do you do we separate out environmental activation and activation of vitiligo susceptibility genetic process? And a second Sorry, you broke up. I, I couldn't understand. Yeah. How do we separate out environmental activation and inactivation of vitiligo susceptibility genetic process? This is one of the question. Uh, and another question that we have is that is, do you think an increase in autoimmune condition is a trigger for later on set of vitiligo? Oh, so I, I still don't understand the first question, but the second okay. question I can answer. So the, yeah. do I think that essentially all vitiligo is autoimmune based? Yes. Um, there's not really a difference between, so there's not a difference in, for example, association with other autoimmune diseases in early onset versus late. Um, th there is a little, but not much. Um, and there's actually a slightly reduced association with other autoimmune diseases in the early onset group because that's being driven by a particular HLA haplotype. And that HLA haplotype is ultra high risk for vitiligo, but it's actually protective for many other autoimmune diseases. So it's very specific. Um, but yeah, I think all vitiligo is basically autoimmune, not all, but there could be a few exceptions, but most vitiligo is basically autoimmune. So I think that if the progressive delay of vitiligo onset is being driven by an increased prevalence of later onset vitiligo, which is what I now think, um, then what that suggests is that we are causing more autoimmune disease in our environment. And that's clearly true for type one diabetes, and there have only been a few studies of type 1 diabetes, but it does appear that age of onset is getting earlier over time. Uh, for, and that was what stimulated my looking at vitiligo in the first place. Okay. Unfortunately, we have several other questions to you. I hope that you can open uh, the chat and eventually you can provide some answer by sure. writing to that because there are several questions that rise, of course. No? But unfortunately, we have uh, to go on. And it's really my, so thank you again, Professor Spritz, for your talk.